Okay, so let's have another go at this. So, my name's James Gill, and this is another podcast for uh, the Rubber Glove uh, series of medical revision podcasts, brought to you in association with Titanium Health for all your locum needs. Okay, that's done. Um, so today we're going to talk about the thyroid examination. This is a very common um, examination. This is done uh, very early on at most medical schools. And we're going to try and look at some of the science behind uh, what it is that you do. So I think we need to really start off and look at the patient globally. You know, what effects do uh, patients with hyper or hypothyroidism have? And then we'll go on to look at why we do different bits on the examination and also just probably chat around things that can affect the thyroid in different ways across the episode. So what is the thyroid gland? The thyroid gland is an endocrine or hormone gland found at the very bottom of the uh, neck here, just beneath your thyroid cartilage. Um, and it's there really to act as the accelerator for the body, if we're going to use an analogy from cars. If you've got a hypo or low functioning thyroid, then it's like you can't press down very hard on the accelerator. Everything's slow, a little bit sluggish, and it's difficult to get going. Conversely, if, everything, if you've got a hyperthyroidism or an overactive thyroid, then it's like your accelerator's slammed flat to the floor and you're driving around in second gear all the while. You've got an awful lot of acceleration, but everything's just cranked up to 11 and you're running, um, you're going to run the engine down, you're going to potentially cause damage over the long term. And we see that with a patient where they may have risks to their heart remodeling in the long term if, we, if they have an untreated hyperthyroidism. So let's start off by just doing a brief overview of the broad symptoms that we may find in hyper and hypothyroidism. And that'll give us an idea of the things that we're going to look for in the examination. It's not unusual to find out that a patient has a problem with their thyroid based upon the symptoms that they come into the clinic with. And we need to highlight again that symptoms are the things patients come in with, they're the things that they complain about, the problems that they have, versus signs, which are the things that doctors look for and may observe on a patient. So in terms of the symptoms, a patient who has hypo or an underactive thyroid may come in and say that they are feeling very tired, that they're having problems putting on weight and that they're very cold. If we compare that to somebody who is hyperthyroidism, that patient may be losing weight and for no obvious reason. They may find that they're very agitated a lot of the time and a little bit um, skittish, if you will. You know, they can't sit still very well. And in addition to that, whereas our hypothyroidism patient, our underactive patient, is feeling cold, our hypothyroidism patient is going to feel very hot all the while. They're going to want the heating turned down. You know, they'll be running around in winter in just shorts and t-shirts when everyone else is bundled up in their uh, heavy coats and jumpers. So you can begin right from the get-go to get an image of what these patients might look like in your head. A patient that has hypothyroidism or an underactive um, thyroid may come in with problems with their hair. They may comment that the hair is dry or that they're getting hair coming out or that they're losing hair on the body generally. Our hyperthyroidism patient, they may still have hair loss as well, but it tends to be more generalised. It's a thinning of the hair. They might also comment, though, that the hair is brittle. It's snapping very easily. If we check some of the patient's signs that they've come in with, if we have a look at their pulse, we may see that in a hyperthyroidism patient, the pulse is much faster than normal, a tachycardia, and in our hypothyroidism patient, we may find a bradycardia, that things are a bit slower. We'll talk a little bit more about those in a moment or two in detail. The hands are an excellent place to look at, as we're going to show in many of the videos. With our hypothyroidism patient, we can get problems with brittle nails, we can get dry, scaly skin, and the hands can actually be a little bit swollen, they can be slightly puffy. By comparison, a patient that has hyperthyroidism, they may come in with um, issues with clubbing. So those swellings uh, to the distal uh, phalanxes on, or on the fingertips. 
which we'd see by putting patients' fingers together and seeing if we've got that diamond between or Shamroth sign. So hypothyroidism is one of that list of things for a clubbing that we need to keep in mind. Other causes of clubbing can be split from their systems, so we can have cardiovascular causes, abdominal causes, respiratory causes, and general causes. I would certainly put hyperthyroidism in general along with, um, say for example, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. What are the other causes of clubbing that you can remember? If we think about cardiovascular, we may have problems with cyanotic um, heart disease, so something like Tetralogy of Fallot, that wonderful one from medical school, bacteria, subacute bacterial endocarditis, where we've got an infection in the heart. On the respiratory side of things, we may find that we have a patient that has a bronchiectasis, so widening of the airways and a lot of mucus production. They might have an emphysema, so where they've got dilation of the actual alveoli and destruction down there. If they have problems with um, asbestosis and pleural thickening, if they've got um, additional issues with the lungs overall, something like an abscess that's taking up some space there in the lung and making them feel generally sick. On our abdominal side, we've got liver cirrhosis and we've got actually the abdomen itself with problems with inflammatory bowel disorders. There are lots of causes for clubbing and it's important that you have a list in your head of at least five things that you can reel off without too big a difficulty. Other things that a patient might comment of may relate to the actual um, throat themselves. They may comment of a swelling there which may be causing difficulty swallowing or potentially changes in their voice. Thinking about the things that a patient can come in with as problems that they're presenting to. Something on the uh, female side, hypothyroidism patients might have problems with their periods, so they may find that they're getting very heavy periods, that the bleed happens for a longer period of time, and they may experience an infertility as a result of this. In addition, um, they may find that the periods are becoming further apart. So rather than a regular 28-day cycle, we can end up having months and months between the periods. So it's always worthwhile, if a patient says that, that we do think about hypothyroidism, our underactive thyroid, but we also keep in mind, could this be pregnancy? On our hyperthyroidism side, we may find that the bleeding gets shorter and much lighter. Some patients with hyperthyroidism might stop bleeding at their um, period altogether. In addition, like our hypothyroidism patient, they may have problems with fertility. Another thing that could happen with our hypothyroidism patient, the period between the menstruation gets larger. With our hyper or overactive, it may become irregular as well as shortened. So you may have a period one week, then nothing for the next two weeks. Then you may have a a three weeks after a period then several bleeds across the month. It can be very variable. So that's our broad overview on the thyroid. Let's look over some specific bits, shall we? An important bit of terminology that's worthwhile discussing at this point is hyperthyroidism, an overactive thyroid, versus thyrotoxicosis, high levels of thyroxine in the blood. Now, a patient may have hyperthyroidism, that their thyroid is working overtime, putting excess thyroxine in the blood. So your hyperthyroidism patient can also have thyrotoxicosis. However, I can take a hypothyroidism patient, so they have low levels of thyroxine in the blood, and give them excess levothyroxine, the medication to replace the thyroxine, give them too much, and cause them to go into thyrotoxicosis. They have too high levels of thyroxine in the blood. But that patient does not have hyperthyroidism. Hopefully, you can see the distinction there between the two. There are two types of autoimmune thyroid disease with the eponymous name Graves' disease and Hashimoto's thyroiditis. I always had difficulty remembering these because they're uh, the similar types of problems. The immune system is affecting the thyroid in some way. With Graves' disease, you have antibodies to the thyroid-stimulating hormone, the TSH receptor, 
on the thyroid. So these antibodies are produced by the body, drive the thyroid harder, causing a hyperthyroidism patient. I've always remembered that, that hyperthyroidism is much more severe and can result in death, i.e. might end up with you going in your grave. By comparison, Hashimoto's thyroiditis is still to do with autoimmune antibodies, but this time they're coming to destroy the um, thyroid gland, resulting in a hypothyroidism patient, which we can easily treat with rep replacing their thyroxine levels. So that's a reasonable overview of the thyroid in terms of what may or may not come in the door. But it's important that we make sure the information we get from the patient is also has sufficient clarification to it. So on each of these symptoms, I want to know what the onset is, what the duration is, how bad or the severity of these symptoms, whether or not they're intermittent or continuous, what's the course of this? Have they noticed that there may be any precipitating factors? For example, have they started any new medications? We'll see in a minute that there are medications that can cause thyroid um, disease in terms of hypothyroidism, but also cause the um, thyroid to be overactive. And are there any family members that have had similar problems to this in the past? Always really useful to find out. So, what drugs can cause hypothyroidism, underactive thyroid? The first one, amiodarone, is a, a cardiac drug where we uh, used to treat arrhythmias. A bit of a dirty medication, it can cause fibrosis in a patient. So before we start that, we must do a chest x-ray and check their thyroid gland to make sure there are no problems there. Lithium, if we've got a patient who has bipolar, that can cause hypothyroidism in one third of patients. Hence why this is a medication we must ensure that we monitor the patients with carefully. Phenytoin, one of our anti-epileptic medications, can cause an increase in thyroid hormone consumption. So whilst it's not affecting the thyroid gland itself, the hormone that the thyroid is producing is broken down faster when you're using this medication. If we have um, carbamazepine, another anti-epileptic medication, that can stop the um, thyroxine, the T4, being released into the blood. So there are medications acting directly on the thyroid. Sodium valparate, another anti-epilepsy medication, are you noticing a pattern here, can cause hypothyroidism, but only subclinically. So biochemically, when we have a look at their blood results, we can see evidence of hypothyroidism, but we don't actually have the patients normally complaining of symptoms. Another medication you may be aware of, diazepam can cause hypothyroidism. We also need to think about the progesterone-only pill because this can affect uh, thyroid-stimulating hormone uptake. So it may mean the gland isn't responsive as it should be to signals to say, make more thyroid hormone, making a hypothyroidism patient. And finally, the most important um, medication that causes hypothyroidism is carbimazole. I say that because this is a medication we use to intentionally ratchet down the um, thyroid gland when we have a patient that has hyperthyroidism. So obviously we want to make sure that we're not giving a patient that accidentally. Now, if we look at drugs that can cause hyperthyroidism, the first medication on our list, surprisingly, is amiodarone. Yes, this can cause both a hypothyroidism, as we've seen, but in 6% of people can actually push the thyroid to become overactive, giving a hyperthyroidism. Fruzamide can theoretically cause a hyperthyroidism, but that's more um, academic in the sense that because it's a diuretic or a water tablet helping patients to lose fluid, it can cause the blood to be more concentrated and thus you've got more thyroxine than you had before by comparison, just it's more concentrated in the blood. Now we talked about the progesterone only pill having issues with hypothyroidism, but estrogen and HRT can potentially cause hyperthyroidism, but this is a very, very rare side effect. Finally, something to think about is iodine containing medications, because iodine is used to stimulate the thyroid gland. So in places such as Derbyshire, for example, classically you get a 
hypothyroidism and a big goiter called Derbyshire neck. That was because Derbyshire being so far inland is actually the furthest point from the sea and thus has the least amount of iodine uh, in the food up there. I'm from Derbyshire myself, but so far I'm unaffected by this, although some people might consider myself to be slightly slow on the uptake some days. In terms of iodine though, iodine is actually seen in some cough medications. So we can find that if a patient is taking too much iodine in from various sources, then that can push a patient to have an overactive thyroid. From a neurological standpoint, in the same way that our hypothyroidism patient is a bit lethargic, they're feeling slow, they might have difficulty concentrating or paying attention to things. If we check their reflexes, we're going to find that actually, unlike normal, they're going to have slow reflexes. By comparison, our hyperthyroidism patient, they're likely to have brisk reflexes that respond much faster than we might expect things to happen. So that completes this thyroid overview uh, for the Rubber Glove podcast. I hope this has been useful for you. Um, I've tried to look over some of the background science, uh, but also the, mainly focused on the reasons why we do and look for particular things in the clinical examination, hopefully giving you a more of a grounding as to what it is you're doing every time you examine these patients. Please feel free to give as much criticism as you'd like in the feedback down below. I can't get any better with these if I don't know how you would like me to improve or how I could change things. So please stick, hit the like button and the follow and uh, I'll see you for the next one. Take care.